Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and we are continuing testimony on H57, or an act relating to preserving the right to abortion. We've heard from a couple of folks, and today we're going to continue, and this, then on Friday, we will continue with additional testimony. Um, and then there is, I know there's a, a person that I was supposed to be on the schedule today and cannot be on the schedule today, so I'm rescheduling her for next week. So that will basically be our line of testimony. So um, our fir first witness is Dr. Gibson, so why don't you come up? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, why don't we introduce ourselves once? We already met Ann Cummings. Nice to meet you. Jenny Lyons. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Take, I know that you're, you uh, are, have clinic coming up or are in the middle of clinic, so we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Mm -hmm. Do we have your testimony online? I don't know that I've sent this yet, uh, but okay, I can well, send we it. We will get it. Yes, okay. I'm happy to send it. Right, Absolutely. Um, good morning, Chairperson Lyons and members of the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare. I am very grateful to all of you for the opportunity to be here today to show my support for Bill H57, an act relating to preserving the right to abortion, which would codify abortion rights in Vermont law. My name is Dr. Erica Gibson, and I'm a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. In my day-to-day -day work, I am the director of adolescent medicine at UVMCH, where I see patients in the adolescent medicine specialty clinic, the transgender youth program, at Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Facility, and on the pediatric hospital ward. I also have grant funding to work on a variety of adolescent health issues, including teen pregnancy prevention, prescription opioid abuse prevention, and adolescent well care. Previous to coming to Vermont, I worked at Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, where I had appointments in both the Department of Pediatrics and in the Department of Population and Family Health at the Mailman School of Public Health. Today, I am speaking as a physician as a member of the executive board of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and as a member of the Vermont Medical Society. As you may already know, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Vermont Medical Society both strongly support minors' rights to confidential sexual and reproductive services, including abortion. Many other professional medical organizations also support access to confidential abortion care for minors, including the American Medical Association, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, the American Public Health Association, and many others. I have spent the majority of my medical career focusing on adolescent sexual and reproductive health care, including prevention of unintended teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. Access to safe and confidential abortion services has also been a part of that work. I believe that abortion is part of the full spectrum of reproductive health care, and it should be treated as the normal and common experience that it is. As you may already have heard, nationally, only 3% of abortion patients are 15 to 17 years old, and only 0.2% are under 15 years old. I come here before you today to describe how minors' rights to confidential sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion, are essential to the health and well-being of the young people that we care for. I feel that H57 should codify current practice with regard to abortion care in this state and no changes should be made to the status quo. Confidentiality in adolescent and young adult health care is clinically essential, developmentally expected, and is an important element in protecting the health of individual young people and the public health. Decades of research have found that privacy protection encourages young people to seek essential health care and speak openly with health care providers. Likewise, other research shows that if patients are not assured confidentiality, they actually avoid seeking health care or involving trusted adults in decision making. Many state and federal laws, as well as ethical guidelines, require confidentiality protection and support the rights of adolescents and young adults to receive confidential health care in certain situations, particularly related to sexual and reproductive health, mental health, and substance use. 
It should be noted that when agreeing to confidential health care services, a clinician needs to take into account whether a young person has the cognitive and emotional ability to understand the nature and risks of a proposed treatment and is capable of making an informed and rational choice. It is ironic to note that in some states, parent and pregnancy um, pregnant and parenting teens are allowed to fully consent to their own care and care of their fetus or child while they are not allowed to make the confidential choice to choose an abortion if they desire to do so at the same age. While I routinely offer confidential health care to my patients as appropriate, the majority of young people that I care for do involve a trusted parent, guardian, or adult in sexual and reproductive health care decisions. We also know that most minors faced with an unplanned pregnancy will voluntarily disclose to a parent or a trusted adult. 61% of minors that have an abortion do so with at least one parent's knowledge, and younger teens are more likely to involve a parent. As clinicians caring for these young people, this is one of the first questions we ask them when they are faced with a challenging decision. What adults can you rely on for support in your decision making? How can we help you to communicate with them? What can we do to help? In terms of unplanned pregnancy, we know that every pregnancy is unique and every individual's decision about their pregnancy is deeply personal. We also know that some young people do not live in supportive and functional home circumstances. They may choose not to involve parents in abortion decisions due to adverse home situations, including family trauma, instability, household substance abuse, or physical or sexual abuse, many of the issues that we now recognize as adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Young people may also choose to keep a decision about abortion confidential due to fear, fear for their own safety, fear of disappointing parents or damaging <coughs> relationships with them. They may fear judgment, shame, or rejection. They may fear being forced to continue a pregnancy. In addition, some may not even feel close to or live with their designated parent or guardian. While federal law guarantees a minor's rights to an abortion, in some states, parental involvement laws require that a minor either notify a parent or guardian or obtain parental consent prior to obtaining an abortion. Forty years ago, the US Supreme Court ruled that there must be a waiver process available to minors who do not or cannot involve a parent in their abortion decision, a process known as judicial bypass. Recent research on the adolescent experience with judicial bypass reveals the following. Adolescents experience the bypass process as a form of punishment for their sexuality, pregnancy, and abortion decision. The process includes logistical burdens, unpredictability, and humiliation, resulting in traumatic experiences for some. This combined sense of punishment, humiliation, and internalization of abortion stigma can be associated with isolation, emotional suppression, long-term psychological distress, and hesitancy to seek health care. Such a negative experience is highly consequential for adolescents going through a critical development period, particularly for adolescents that have little support from their own parents. It is particularly hard to understand why we would force a young person to go through the judicial bypass experience in light of the scientific evidence that there is no association between abortion and risk of depression, suicide, and other emotional harms. In summary, the majority of young women are capable of understanding the consequences of abortion and do not need state-mandated parental involvement or judicial bypass to make the decisions that are right for them. Those of us that are experts in the field of adolescent medicine feel that most young women are mature enough to decide whether to carry a pregnancy or seek an abortion, and we know that most seek out advice on their own from parents or trusted adults. In addition, we feel that mandated parental notification, consent, or judicial bypass can actually be more harmful to an adolescent than seeking an abortion. I want to thank you, Senator Lyons, and the entire Vermont legislature for their commitment to protecting women's rights to reproductive health access here in our state. On behalf of my patients, the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Vermont Medical Society, I respectfully ask the Vermont Senate to pass H57 to ensure that abortion rights and minors' rights to confidential abortion services are protected here in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> questions? Senator? Question? I don't know that we have any questions, but we certainly know where you are located. And yes. We, if we do have questions, we'll, we'll um, get back to you. And what would be very helpful is to have your testimony um, for the record, and then we can access it on our iPad. 
I'll send it immediately. And um, don't drive too fast on the way back to the clinic. <laughs> I will not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the time you put into that. That wasn't. Uh, that's that's a lot of information. It will take us time to really digest all of it. Thank My you. pleasure. I feel it's very important. Right, so, uh, Bryn, we're not going to go to you. We're just you're just here. Okay, that's good. Um, Chloe White of um, ACLU. Good morning. Morning. Do we? Ha I haven't looked. Do we have yours online? Yes, and I didn't get to give you the requisite yeah. hard copy. What what I failed to say in the beginning is this that um, Senator Ingram is, is sick. Oh. And Senator McCormick went to Representative Forgate's um, funeral, so we're, we are still a majority. <coughs> There's still a quorum. And it's very important for us to have testimony so that um, they can also read it. Thank you for that. Um, good morning. For the record, I'm Chloe White. I am the policy director at the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, I want to thank you for inviting us uh, to speak on this important bill. We fully support it and we urge you to pass it out of committee. This bill safeguards the right to abortion and codifies what is already legal in the state. It ensures that at every point in a pregnancy, the health of the person is paramount and drives important personal medical decisions. Vermont has always followed and applied Roe v. Wade, which recognizes that abortion is included in the fundamental right to privacy. The future of Roe v. Wade and access to safe and legal reproductive care is under threat, however, as was made clear in Justice Kavanaugh's recent dissent in June Medical Services v. G, a case which could have closed nearly all abortion clinics in Louisiana and essentially dismantled Roe. In his dissent, Justice Kavanaugh effectively ignored the holding of Whole Women's Health v. Hellerset, which is a 2016 Supreme Court case that invalidated a Texas law similar to the one at issue in Louisiana and would have allowed a restrictive admitting privileges law to go into effect, contrary to established precedent. It was only through Justice Roberts' fifth vote that the law was kept on hold, at least for now. Given the very real threat to reproductive liberty at the federal level, it is imperative that Vermont codify this right in state statute. And this sort of legislation is not unprecedented. In 2017, Oregon passed the Reproductive Health Equity Act, which safeguards the right to abortion from interference by public entities, just as this bill does. Uh, Illinois is currently considering the Reproductive Health Act, which provides that every pregnant individual has a fundamental right to carry or terminate that pregnancy. At least nine states have statutes explicitly protecting the right to abortion, and Vermont should join these states and enshrine the protection in statute. And in conclusion, I just want to again stress our full support for this bill, which simply creates a legal framework for what is already legal here in this state, but it is not codified yet in this state, and we believe that this codification is absolutely essential. Uh, this bill preserves the status quo and affirms Vermont's dedication to liberty and to privacy. We urge you to pass it, and uh, thank you again for having me. I look forward to any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. So. Um Questions? Very silent this morning. Thank you. I, obviously, we have heard testimony previously on Proposition 5, mm -hmm. so some of what we're going to hear is going to be uh, repetitive, but um, the, the recent dissent, yeah, we, haven't, we didn't hear testimony about previously mm -hmm. from Justice Kavanaugh, so that's helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very we're welcome. Good. Thank you. Um, Sharon Tobor. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, you are. All right. Good. Thank you for being here. Thank you. For the record, my name is Sharon Toborg. I'm a policy analyst for the Vermont Right to Life Committee. Do we have yours on No, you don't. It's, but we will get it. Yes, you will. Thank you. Yes. Um, the committee's considering H57 has focused largely on how abortion is currently practiced in this state. This is a mistake. What abortion providers say is current practice is different than what H57 would allow. This legislation would allow unlimited, unregulated abortion throughout pregnancy 
and very importantly, prohibits public entities from interfering with abortion. While abortion advocates have stated repeatedly that abortions done later in pregnancy are only done for reasons of fetal abnormality or maternal health, that is simply not true. And one need only look at the debate over the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act to, to, to know that this is not true. Partial birth abortion, also called intact dilation and extraction, or DNX, its supporters said, was rarely used and only in the most extreme cases. Our doctor, Governor Howard Dean, was on the national news, saying there are at most a few hundred such procedures being performed annually until a newspaper reporter went into her local abortion facility and asked. Ruth Padaware, a reporter for the Bergen, New Jersey Record, interviewed physicians who used the method who revealed that at one clinic alone, at least 1,500 partial birth abortions were being performed each year, and only a, quote, minuscule amount were for medical reasons. Ron Fitzsimmons, the executive director of the National Coalition of Abortion Providers, admits he, quote, lied through his teeth, end quote, when he said on national television that partial birth abortions were used rarely and only on women whose lives were in danger or cases of fetal anomaly. Why the dishonesty? Because for the abortion rights movement, unrestricted abortion throughout pregnancy is not a philosophical problem. It is a public relations problem. Because when the truth comes out and the deception becomes clear, the people reject unlimited, the unlimited abortion agenda. Congress voted to prohibit partial birth abortion in 2003. The legislation was supported by pro-life and pro-choice lawmakers. And even our own pro-choice Senator Patrick Leahy voted in favor of the ban. Planned Parenthood challenged the law, but it was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2007. But the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act does not prohibit abortions later in pre pregnancy. It prohibits a specific type of procedure. So abortion practitioners perform later abortions still, but using other methods. And as legislators, you need to consider the full implications of H-57. There are those who would correctly point out that abortion has been legal throughout pregnancy in Vermont for decades, yet we do not have the later in pregnancy abortion clinics that some other states have. However, by adopting H57, the state would not only be legally embracing unrestricted, unlimited, unregulated abortion throughout pregnancy, the public entities section of the bill would remove the significant regulatory barriers that an abortionist would currently face if he chose to practice in Vermont. H57 <clears throat> declares that a public entity shall not restrict abortion access. What does that mean? An abortion facility could be exempted from the certificate of need process, Act 250, municipal zoning regulations, all of those barriers that legitimate businesses face when trying to set up shop in Vermont would violate H57 if applied to an abortion business that wanted to come into our state. So when an abortionist like Kermit Gosnell or James Pendergrast or Robert Rowe or Stephen Brigham, who have all faced charges in other states, loss of medical license for their involvement in uh, Illegal late-term abortions, how the media describes it, but of course in Vermont we know there's no such thing as an illegal late-term abortion. The state will have no legal recourse to prevent it, monitor the practice, or intervene until, even if women are injured, and maybe not even until some women are killed. It is important to remember that the Medical Practice Board and the Office of Professional Regu Regulation are public entities and under age 57 would be prohibited from interfering with a provider's choice to do abortions. So uh, when this debate was going on on the House side, it was stated repeatedly that should an abortion practitioner try to do elective uh, abortions later in pregnancy, they would face repercussions from the medical practice board. That can't happen under age 57. 
And while most of the attention ha thus far has focused on the legal status of abortion, the testimony taken in the House Judiciary Committee confirms that H57 will make significant changes to Vermont law. It will protect abortion above childbirth and will restrict pro-life free speech. Section 9497 prohibits a public entity from restricting access to abortion. It does not, however, prohib re prohibit restricting access to childbirth. Under H57, individuals, including abortion providers, could have a right of action against the state should they be denied a certificate need for an uh, abortion facility. Or, as was suggested in uh, House Judiciary, if the state tried to impose an across-the-board reduction in funding for health care programs that had an effect of reducing taxpayer funding for abortion, they could have a right of action in that regard. Providers and recipients of other medical services would have no such right. And because many of the terms in the bill are vague and undefined, it is unknown the full extent of the impact. Testimony in House Judiciary Committee confirmed, however, that schools as public entities would be affected by this legislation. It was suggested that pro-abortion messages in our schools would be protected, while anti-abortion messages could be subject to restriction. So H57 is not simply a codification of current abortion practice in Vermont. It is a far-reaching bill intended to promote and protect abortion above other alternatives in our state. In her testimony in the House, Megan Gallagher, CEO of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, encouraged passage of H57, claiming it represents the people of Vermont's position on abortion. In this committee, it has been said that unlimited abortion represents Vermont's values. It does not. While most Vermonters consider themselves pro-choice, that does not mean they support unrestricted abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy for individuals of any age, as H57 proposes. In a poll commissioned by Vermont Right to Life in 2000, 59% of Vermonters called themselves pro-choice but only 11% said abortion should always be legal. 72% of Vermonters said excluding abortion, it should be a crime in Vermont for someone to hurt or kill an unborn child in the womb, either intentionally or through negligence. 72% also supported requiring a physician or a clinic to notify a parent before performing an abortion on a daughter who is under 18 years of age. While this polling data is from some years ago, a May 2018 Gallup poll also demonstrates that being pro-choice does not equal support for the full agenda of the abortion lobby. It found that 48% of Americans consider themselves pro-choice, but only 13% said abortion should be generally legal in the last three months of pregnancy. In 2011, the most recent year that Gallup asked the question, 71% of Respondents supported a law requiring women under 18 to get parental consent, not just notification, for any abortion, even though 40% of, 47% of respondents considered themselves pro-choice. H57 would prohibit abortion regulations and fe fetal homicide laws favored by Vermonters. And we have to remember the abortion lobby calls nearly every regulation intended to protect the health and safety of women having abortions interference with the right to choose. How would Vermont be able to protect women from abortion providers like Kermit Gosnell, who is currently in prison for killing two of his patients and murdering infants born alive? What tools would the state have to put, keep someone like him out of Vermont? Under age 57, the answer is none. Proponents of this bill have stated that it is important for the legislature to make it clear where they stand on abortion. And I agree. When the roll is called on H57, each and every legislator will go on record as being for or against unrestricted abortion throughout pregnancy, for or against a parent's right to know, for or against protecting abortion, for or against placing abortion in a privileged place in our public policy. Will they declare by their votes that Vermont is indifferent to the health and safety of women seeking abortion? 
indifferent as to whether a viable unborn baby is born or aborted, lives or dies? I hope not. And I'd be glad to take any questions. Hey, thank you. Um, obviously, the first part of your um, discussion and testimony was about partial birth abortion, which uh, in the bill, we recognize that that state uh, federal law is recognized, so it's not really. Well, the, the first part of my testimony was about how the abortion lobby misleads the general public as to the circumstances and reasons behind later in pregnancy abortions. I understand that Vermont cannot supersede federal law with regard to partial birth abortion, but that is uh, not the point I was trying to make. Okay, thank you. Okay, questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Carrie Brown, Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. <clears throat> for the record, Carrie Brown, I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today about the connection between access to reproductive health care, including abortion, and women's economic security. I, we have a policy. Do you have your testimony? Uh, you no. do not have, not yet. have it, not yet. Not yet. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wanted so, to make sure it was completely yeah. uh, spick and span. Um, so the Commission on Women takes, uh, has policy statements covering many different areas. And I'd like to read you our policy position on reproductive health care. The Vermont Commission on Women affirms that every woman has a natural and unalienable right to choose whether and when to bear children, the right to educational, medical, and counseling services to make that choice wisely, and the right to the appropriate support in order to create a secure economic future based on that choice. The ability to decide when and whether to have a child is one of the most important factors in a woman's economic well-being over the course of her lifetime. Having control over the timing of children allows women to increase their own education, make better investments in their early work and career choices, and create better outcomes for their children. Women's access to reproductive health care is tied to increased labor force participation, higher earnings, more advanced careers, and better financial conditions for their children and families. I'd like to speak a little bit about access to contraception in general. In the 1960s and 1970s, the introduction of oral contraceptives and repeal of laws restricting the sale of contraceptives in general, coupled with the expansion of funding for family planning programs, provided a significant increase in women's access to birth control. Looking back, it's possible to link this access years later to an increase in women's wages, their labor force participation, family incomes, and even their children's college completion rates. Children born after this access increased were 15% less likely to live in households receiving public assistance and 4% less likely to live with a single parent. This access also contributed to an increase in the number of women employed in non-traditional and professional occupations and to higher occupational levels in general. Increased access to birth control can even be credited for <coughs> helping to reduce the gender wage gap. One analysis showed that access to the birth control pill by younger unmarried women in the 1960s and 1970s increased their hourly earnings by 8% by the time they were 50 years old. The same analysis concluded that the pill can account for 10% of the reduction of the gender wage gap in the 1980s and 30% in the 1990s. And just as a side note, I will note that the Commission on Women has been tracking this wage gap over time for decades, and we really saw dramatic increases in the 70s and 80s and really kind of a leveling off from the 90s and on. And so it's so that may be one of the reasons why we saw that kind of sharp increase in the past. Access to birth control is linked to increases in women's wages, in their participation in the workforce, and in their families' reliance on their earnings. While having a child at all does create both an immediate decrease in women's earnings and a long-term decrease in their lifetime earnings, delaying having a child can mitigate some of this loss. A delay allows time for investing in education and in early work experience, and women 
earn 3% more for each year they delay having children. Children whose mothers had access to birth control have higher family incomes, are less likely to live in poverty, and are more likely to go to college. And then looking specifically to a lack of access to abortion, the most common reason women give for seeking an abortion is that they aren't able to afford the cost of having a child. Low-income women are particularly impacted by lack of access to abortion. They're over five times more likely to become pregnant unintentionally than higher-income women, despite being sexually active at the same rates. Nationally, half the women seeking abortions have incomes below the federal poverty level, and three-quarters reported not having enough money to pay for basic living expenses. In one study, women who were unable to get the abortion they sought were almost four times as likely to have their household income fall below the federal poverty level and were more likely to report not being able to cover basic living needs. Women who were denied an abortion were more likely to receive public assistance than those women who received abortions. Women denied abortions were more likely to end up in the future raising children alone in single parent households than were women who received an abortion. And women denied an abortion have lower levels of full-time employment. And then I'll just conclude with um, one, uh, one additional finding from that study. Children born later to women who are able to get an abortion are more likely to live in households where there is enough money to pay for basic living expenses than children born because abortion was denied. Abortion denial also affects maternal bonding. Women are much more likely to report feeling trapped as a mother, resenting their baby, or wishing for the old days when they had no baby after abortion denial than with the next child born after receiving an abortion. So that. Are, are those are the studies referenced in your... They are. They're all footnoted. So I'll make sure that you get a copy of this so you I have mean, the references. Because uh, we can't accept a, just a blank statement without having some... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all um, research that's cited. No, thank you very much. It's great. Um, questions? Senator, question? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you and, for your time. And will you get the, the your testimony to uh, I, Maya? I will send it right to her, and then she can post it for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Jessica Bar Barquist. Said that wrong. Hi, no, you said it right. All right, thank you for being here. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Jessica Barquist, and I am the new Director of Policy and Organizing for the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And I am pleased to speak with you this morning in support of H57. As Vermont's leading voice on domestic and sexual violence, the Vermont Network works to promote policies that support victims and survivors of violence to thrive and live lives free from violence. There's a strong correlation between domestic and sexual violence and the reproductive health and well-being of women. Domestic and sexual abuse takes many forms, including physical violence and emotional, psychological, and financial abuse. Although victims and survivors may be both men and women and individuals of all races, identities, and ages, national data indicates that women are the greatest risk of violence from their intimate partners in their reproductive years. One important and often overlooked form of abuse is reproductive and sexual coercion. Reproductive and sexual coercion is a form of violence that involves behaviors intended to exert control over an intimate partner's reproductive health, including contraceptive use and pregnancy. Victims who experience reproductive and sexual coercion may experience their intimate partners using threat or violence to impact their access to contraception, coercing their partners to engage in sex or threatening to hurt a partner who does not agree to become pregnant. Several studies have documented a strong link between individuals experiencing violence and unintended pregnancies. Women with unintended pregnancies are four times more likely to experience intimate partner violence than women whose pregnancies were intended. In addition, it has been demonstrated that the prevalence of intimate partner violence is specifically higher for women seeking abortion services compared with women who desire to continue their pregnancies. Unfortunately, limiting or controlling a person's reproductive choice and agency is one way that abusive partners perpetuate involvement in victims' lives. It is very common for abusive partners to use pregnancy as a strategy to keep their partners in their lives and remain connected to them through children. Even if a relationship ends, Abusive partners often use custody or other family court processes 
to harass, intimidate, or control their former partners and co-parents of their child for decades. Victims encounter many barriers to leaving an abusive relationship, and victims' reproductive health should not be one of these barriers. It is essential that victims of domestic and sexual violence have full reproductive choice and autonomy. And for this reason, and those listed above, we strongly support age 57. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you took um, Auburn Water Song's place? Yes, I did. Questions? No questions? So um, do we have yours? You should, yes. We do. Yep. Have it. Thank you. Yeah. And Thank you. Um, so, as I said, if we have further questions, we'll let you know. But Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. Garen Marshall. Garen, thank you for being here. I think you've come from New York. Sorry. Yes, from Brooklyn. From all the way from Brooklyn. Well, yeah. we're glad. It's a short six it's, hour drive. It's fairly good weather. Okay. Yeah, so. that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, thank you for your testimony. And um, I, I think I, I also have a, a New Yorker article. Um, written about what you're going to be presenting to us yes. that I will share with uh, the committee at some point. Okay, great. Um, yes, my name is Garen Marshall. I'm, as you said, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I'm not here on behalf of any organization or anything. Um, my wife and I are patient advocates, um, and we sort of just wanted to come, I wanted to come and uh, share some perspective patient perspective um, with regard to this bill. Um, in, uh, in 2016, uh, my wife and I were going through our second pregnancy. Our first pregnancy ended in miscarriage at 10 weeks, um, which was uh, heartbreaking because we very much wanted that pregnancy. Um, and so we entered into the next pregnancy with a bit of uh, hesitancy. Um, and, but you know, but we were excited when, when we easily got pregnant again. Obviously that's hard for some people. Um, early in the pregnancy, things seemed to be going fine. We passed that 10 week mark and we're very happy. Um, and then we started to get some concerning indications from our doctors as, as the pregnancy progressed. Um, so I won't go into all of the medical details, but, um, there were just some little things that started happening. Nothing added up to anything particularly bad. Um, but it looked like it might become a complicated pregnancy. So we were moved to a high risk OB uh, and started getting ultrasounds pretty regularly during the pregnancy. Um, and like a lot of pregnancies, uh, we were sort of hanging on to hope and just trying to get to a point where, um, you know, medical interventions could, could sort of swoop in if necessary. Um, so we were sort of going in week after week, and then at 30 weeks we went in and there was an excess of amniotic fluid. Um, and we, our doctors explained that that meant that the, the fetus couldn't swallow, and that indicated that it wouldn't be able to breathe outside the womb. Um, and we were heartbroken because we very much wanted this pregnancy and had sort of been holding on, just sort of white knuckling it that far. Um, and that was the point that our doctor also informed us that they couldn't really help us beyond that. Um, our, our options were to continue the pregnancy um, and just sort of let what happened happen. Um, or we could, due to, due to the law in New York at the time, we could leave the state um, and seek care outside of the state. Uh, but even though our, our doctors had the medical capability to help us, um, they, due to the law, could not. What was the law? That so the law in New York at the time was, um, uh, it actually was unconstitutional. Um, it predated Roe, and it, it wouldn't allow an abortion to be performed after 24 weeks unless there was an immediate threat to the life of the person. So in our case, even though the pregnancy was not viable and due to some other circumstances, it was threatening my wife's health, um, th those were not reasons that allowed them to provide care. Um, 
so at that point, we, you know, we, we knew that we didn't want to continue the pregnancy because, um, it, it, like I said, it threatened my wife's health and, and the thought of continuing a pregnancy and maybe getting to the point where, if born, the baby would choke for a few moments and die just seemed terrible to us. Um, so we, we sought a termination, and that's when we found out that you know, there's a handful of providers in the country that, that could take patients. Um, at this point, after, after sort of getting some things together, we were at 32 weeks. Um, and we, we ended up having to borrow money from um, my mother-in-law. She took it out of her retirement account. Um, a lot of the, these clinics don't take insurance, really, because they never get reimbursed. Uh, so you sort of have to pay up front. Um, we ended up, because of my wife's health situation, we ended up having to come up with $10,000 uh, in, in about two weeks, which is a lot. <laughs> I don't know if it's a lot for it's everybody, lot for but it's a lot. A lot of people. <laughs> um, and we we had to quickly arrange flights and the hotel and rental car and everything and and get to Colorado and um, we had to get our our doctors and the doctor there on the same page and it, and it was pretty complicated. Um, and you know we're middle class people who had you know supportive family members. We were able to sort of get the money together. And ultimately, we were able to get to Colorado and get the treatment that we needed, um, and you know, came back to New York. And uh, then, so so we went to Colorado, um, and then came back. And my wife was induced in a hospital in New York, and she went through 30 hours of labor, um, again for a pregnancy that was not viable. Um, so I think it's important to just, you know, the, the reason that I wanted to share that story is, is partly just to provide some patient perspective on what later abortions often are. There's a lot of rhetoric flying around about what, what abortions later in pregnancy are and, and why people get them. And, um, you know, they, they're, they're always a complicated situation. It's not an easy procedure. It is not a frivolous thing that someone would enter into. Uh, it's not cheap currently. Um, and the, the rhetoric that we're hearing about these procedures doesn't match patient experiences. Since going through our procedure and then working in New York and sharing our story um, to get the law there changed, uh, we've met people from all over the country who have have terminated later in pregnancy for, for a number of reasons. Uh, we've met with the providers um, that actually provide care, both, both the one that we went to and, and then a couple of the other clinics. Um, they're all incredibly nice people who are really trying to help people. Um, it's important to note that the human body doesn't really follow legal timelines, right? Um, that's why it's important for doctors to sort of be making the call instead of, um, frankly, you guys. <laughs> um, uh, we're used to <laughs> um, You know, New, New York changed its law after 50 years, and I, I don't think we want to define health every 50 years. Um, so it's, it's important to, to sort of allow some vagarity that can be defined by doctors, I think. And, that, and that's why, you know, I, I, I think the law being proposed with H57 is, is, is great. I think it's exactly what the law should be. Um, because it acknowledges that we can't draw neat lines around every person's situation. So um, if someone, you know, we've, we've heard terrible stories about why people need this care. Um, Many of them are for maternal or fetal health indications. Many of them are for very young people um, who have been raped or, or something like that. And, and that does happen. Um, in other cases, people have been pushed over an imaginary line by the law. Um, they've been pushed over that line because they couldn't get the money together, they couldn't get access to care, all sorts of things. Um, so I think it's important you know, when, when you're talking about these things to really just let, hear from people affected by it whenever possible um, and hear from doctors and, and, and providers that are helping those patients. Um, and just weigh whatever the law is against the actual experiences of the people getting the care, um, not sort of these hypothetical situations that we keep hearing about. Um, 
I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. And I've sent testimony, so. We have your testimony. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions? So uh, you, one of the things you said, uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for being here yeah. again. I know it's not easy, and um, uh, appreciate the stress that you and your wife have gone through in the whole process. I did read the article, and it's a lot more antiseptic than yeah. the real life story. You know? yeah. But um, you say you say now that you're you're working on behalf of patients, and you're working with physicians. Has your experience helped to inform the work of uh, physicians in your own state or other states? Or um, yeah, I think I think a lot of what we're what we're trying to do is to make sure that that people are considering patients and considering the sort of the the full situation that patients are in. Um, so I think that you know we we are certainly now in New York trying to make people understand why the law is important, why, why, why the way in which the law changed is important and, and who it actually helps. And it helps people like us and it helps, you know, I mean, we have a, a lot of patients in New York that we've met. I've looked for patients in Vermont so I could not drive here for six hours, but we, we, haven't, we haven't been able to, to sort of meet one. Um, but I, but I, you know, I also know that they exist. They're probably scared to talk to you. They're scared to come out and talk to their friends and neighbors about what happened to them. And a lot of that is because, you know, we haven't created a compassionate space for people to share their stories. So um, I think that's really important, you know, in, it, let's, let's say whether this law passes or not, but let's say that it passes, it's important to like make sure that we're having a compassionate conversation around it as it passes so that people understand why it's important and who it actually affects. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do <coughs> wherever possible. That's a very important message. Thank you for mm. that. And, and do you now have children? Yes, we have a rambunctious two-year-old. Um, Good luck. Yeah. Who we, I mean, and that's the other thing. Uh, part of the reason that we were, we, we, we were happy to be able to get the care we did is because, you know, my wife is safe and she was able to go on to have children. And that, that's, that's one thing that like, we need to make sure that when people need this care, they can get the care, that it's safe, et cetera. And, and abortion is very, very safe. It's safer than, you know, I don't know. I'm sure someone can tell you, but. Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, we're, we were, we're very lucky. Um, and we're, we were lucky to be able to get the care. We're lucky now to have our two-year-old. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, safe driving. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy our stay while you're here. Oh, yeah, I went to school here, so. Oh, yeah. oh good. Oh. I love Vermont. That's great. Which school? Uh, Bennington. Oh. All right. Um, Megan Gallagher. Good morning. Good morning. Chairperson Lyons, Vice Chair Westman, and Senator Cummings. My name is Megan Gallagher. I'm the President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, PPNNE. If Roe v. Wade is overturned by the United States Supreme Court, the ability to access safe legal abortion will be determined by the states. The rights we've spent generations fighting for could disappear as soon as this year, and today I'm here on behalf of PPNNE to fully support H57 which would protect access to abortion care in Vermont law. On behalf of our patients, we must keep abortion legal, safe, and free from restrictions. PPNNE is the largest reproductive health care and sexuality education provider in northern New England, where we serve more than 45,000 patients each year across Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Our mission is to provide, promote, and protect access to reproductive health care and sexuality education so that all people can make voluntary choices about their reproductive and sexual health. In Vermont, there are 12 Planned Parenthood health centers, and we provide health services to approximately 19,000 patients annually. Approximately 87% of our patients identify as women, and 89% of them are under the age of 39. Patients come to Planned Parenthood for high-quality, trauma-informed, 
non-judgmental, compassionate, and confidential care. In 2017, PPNE provided contracept contraception to 9,600 patients, nearly 4,800 pregnancy tests, nearly 2,500 cervical cancer screenings, more than 3,500 breast exams, more than 37,000 sexually transmitted infection tests, and approximately 1,100 abortions. The care we provide our patients is primary care, and for many of our patients, PPNNE is their only health care provider. 10 of our 12 Vermont health centers participate in the Title X Federal Family Planning Program. Because of this participation, PPNNE is able to deliver care regardless of a patient's ability to pay. The decision to have an abortion is personal, and the only person who is preg and only the person who is pregnant can decide what is best for them. All PPNNE health centers have compassionate professional staff who provide accurate information and non-judgmental support. We're proud to provide confidential and expert health care to our patients because the outcome of a strong provider-patient relationship is simple: to make sure our patients get the care they need. In the past two years, the Trump administration has shown open hostility toward women's ability to access contraception and abortion. The administration has introduced policy measures that would allow employers to deny women birth control coverage and dismantle Title X, the one program meant to assure that people with low incomes can still access birth control, STD testing and treatment, cancer screenings, and other essential health care. President Trump has also followed through on his campaign commitment to appoint justices to the United States Supreme Court only if they would reverse Roe v. Wade, the 1973 court decision that legalized abortion in this country. With the confirmations of Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, abortion rights are on the line. This year, 16 states have passed or, or are in the process of passing laws that would ban abortion at six weeks before many people know that they are pregnant. A PPNNE board member, member recently shared that a friend asked her if she would be arrested for having an abortion with the changes we've seen at the U.S. Supreme Court. This question is a reminder that many women of reproductive age do not know what their health care will look like if, and likely when, Roe versus Wade is overturned. Vermont, Vermont currently has no laws affirmatively protecting abortion rights. Given the threat to federal protection of these rights, it is important that the Vermont legislature make its and the people of Vermont's position on this issue clear this legislative session. That is what H-57, an act relating to preserving the right to abortion, would do. The bill proposes to recognize as a fundamental right the freedom of reproductive choice and to prohibit public entities from interfering with or restricting the right of an individual to terminate the individual's pregnancy. PPMNNE firmly believes that each person is capable of and must be trusted to make their own health care decisions. The decision about one's pregnancy is up to the person who is pregnant and only that person. There are many factors that contribute to someone's decision to have a family or not, and each of us deserves the right to assess those factors for ourselves. A person's ability to access safe and legal abortion when they need it is a critical component of their health and dignity, as well as independence, freedom, and equality. The ability to access contraception as well as safe and legal abortion allows women to participate fully in society. Many of the gains women have made in obtaining education, pursuing careers, moving closer to pay equity, and in having greater determination over the timing and spacing of their children, as we heard earlier from Carrie Brown, are the direct result of increased access to birth control and abortion. According to the Pew Research Center, 70% of Vermonters support abortion rights. One in four women will have an abortion by the age of 45. In 2016, according to the Vermont Department of Health, there were nearly 1,300 abortions performed in Vermont. Abortion is a common, safe medical procedure and we must protect its legal status in Vermont law. Planned Parenthood of Northern New England urges the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare to pass H-57 to ensure that reproductive freedom is protected in Vermont. We thank and fully su support Vermont's Senate leadership for taking historic 
and common sense actions to move this bill forward. I believe you do not have my testimony, but we will provide it by the end well, of the day. Have, oh, you do? Have most of it, I think, yes. We didn't have the 16 states, but we have the rest of it. Indeed, Here. that is current information. Um, wonderful, thank you, Good. and thank I'm happy you. to answer any questions. Any questions? Oh, I do have a question, actually. It's a strange question, but um, I think it's one that sort of permeates the atmosphere, and that is Planned Parenthood, for some people, has such a bad name. Can you explain why that tarnish exists for your organization? Because of all the things that you're, you're doing, I mean, you're providing contraception, you're providing family planning, you're providing uh, just plain health care to both men and women, and yet people um, detract from the work that you do. And how does that, how does that make, what effect does that have on the organization and your, and the work that you're doing? Thank you, Senator Lyons, for that question. Um, the first thing I would do is clarify that while there are loud voices that oppose the work of Planned Parenthood, the reality is the majority of Americans are deeply supportive of Planned Parenthood and the work that we do. Um, here in northern New England, we uh, have nearly 70% approval ratings. I think the what you are speaking to is um, what uh, a 95-year-old woman I met one day explained to me as the fact that a lie makes its way around the world while the truth is putting its shoes on. And the fact is, is that the incendiary language of our opposition is newsworthy in a headline-driven uh, environment and it catches people's attention and it, and it builds uh, a rhetoric that is not grounded in the reality of people's lives. And so I think our, our work as Planned Parenthood is to bring facts and the reality of people's lives to this conversation to support legislators in making policy that actually enables people uh, to exercise their freedoms. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. That's very helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So um, we're going to move on uh, to um, the Deputy Solicitor General. Um, and then um, I might ask Bryn to come up, or we might and have decided it. So. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Do we? We don't. We don't have your testimony. We do not yet have my written testimony. We know that you will get it to buy it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, for the record, Eleanor Spotswood. I am the Deputy Solicitor General at the Attorney General's Office here in Vermont. So uh, I was last before this committee testifying on uh, Proposition 5, and um, I'd just like to take a moment at the outset to talk about um, some of the differences between H57 and Proposition 5 and why it's important to pass both of these. Um, as we've already heard this morning, uh, the makeup of the US Supreme Court has changed, uh, and the court is expected to either dial back or abolish entirely its protection of reproductive rights essentially at any moment. Um, the amendment, the constitutional amendment, Proposition 5, which you've already passed, uh, will take another three years um, to actually become law in Vermont. Uh, it depends, it's dependent on the next legislature. Uh, it's dependent on being passed by all the voters. Um, so at the moment, it's not assured, obviously. Um, the statute, uh, like all the other statutes this body passes, uh, can take effect immediately um, and is in the total control of this legislature. Um, so it's important to pass the statute now uh, because the changes from the US Supreme Court may come at any moment um, and not wait until the amendment is, is passed uh, by the voters, which is unsure. Um, 
Other key differences between the statute and the constitutional amendment. Uh, the statute is more specific than the constitutional amendment. Um, it lays out, for example, specifics about the kinds of entities that it affects, describes the private right of action. Um, and this is consistent with the differences between statutes and constitutional amendments uh, that we talked about the last time that I was here. Um, you know, the constitutional amendments take a, a big picture view and the statutes dial into the specifics. Um, and again, this makes sense because uh, statutes are much easier to amend or repeal, um, as you know. Uh, and so this statute really creates the framework um, of sort of outlining reproductive rights in statute, and future legislatures uh, can build off the framework that you're making today. Um, and just to remind the committee, the statute can't bind future legislatures. Again, they can change it at any time. Uh, but the constitutional amendment will bind future legislatures if it passes. Uh, and then um, finally, on this point, uh, the statute and the constitutional amendment, um, uh, again, they're ha they work hand in hand. They work towards the same ends. Uh, both are intended to re protect reproductive rights. So if and when the constitutional amendment finally passes, this statute will remain good law. Um, it gives shape to the right that's in the constitutional amendment. Um, it's sort of analogous to, uh, if you think about the way our constitution, both the state constitution and the federal constitution, protect against discrimination. Um, so here in Vermont, we have the Common Benefits Clause. Federally, it's the Equal Protection Clause. Um, but Vermont still has specific anti-discrimination statutes, right? Even though we know that our Constitution protects against discrimination, we've still passed statutes to say this, this thing here is illegal um, or protected by uh, Vermont law as well as the Constitution. Um, so turning to the specifics in the statute itself. Uh, this bill codifies current practice in Vermont um, currently, as we've heard, uh, decisions about abortion and other reproductive choices are private. Uh, they're between a doctor and a patient. Uh, but we don't have any statutes on the books uh, that keeps this practice in place. Uh, we've relied until now on federal case law uh, and the federal constitution in decisions like Roe and Casey's. If we do nothing, the only way the current practice would change, no matter what happens to Roe v. Wade, would be if we passed a law that limited reproductive rights. I mean, it, that's what I, I mean. Nothing's in statute because there's been no movement by the legislature to limit. We've relied on federal law, mm -hmm. but the only way things would change would be if we passed a law limiting rights. Uh, they wouldn't auto, I guess what I'm saying is, would, if Roe v. Wade goes away, mm -hmm. would anything automatically change here? So, uh, two answers to that question, um, and it's a very good question. Uh, the law in Vermont, um, would not automatically change if Roe versus Wade went away. However, the practice in Vermont could change without the law changing. So one of the things that this statute does is it binds uh, executive agencies and the state as an employer uh, from discriminating against abortion um, or reproductive rights or abortion providers um, on the basis of their provision of abortion or on the basis of a patient receiving an abortion. So for, let me give you an example. Um, right now, if Roe versus Wade were overturned and this statute didn't pass, uh, a new Secretary of Human Services could come in and say, you know what, we're pulling the licenses of all the abortion clinics um, and there's nothing in the law that will prevent me from doing that once Roe versus Wade is overturned. Uh, this statute would prevent that. It would prevent executive agencies from taking action against 
people who receive abortions or provide abortions. I think that might be fairly high-risk action, given that the legislature has never taken action to close clinics. I mean, it's not like a secretary Certainly. might have a little trouble with the legislature or the funding for his salary or something. It's an extreme example, yeah. but... Um, but I mean, there is, there has been no indication that Vermont legislatures are just waiting for something to happen unlike other states, to overturn reproductive rights. So I, 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 that's, I, I just want that No, and, the, and even if you pass this statute, it won't prevent future legislatures no. from repealing it, um, as I say. But it will prevent um, executive agencies, municipalities, other arms of the government from doing anything. And like I said, the the licensing is an extreme example, but um, doing anything like requiring multiple doctors to approve an abortion or um, you know, a municipality um, deciding not to provide emergency services to an abortion clinic or... Um, okay, but it has been alleged that this would put such clinics outside the reach of planning, zoning, certificate of need? That has been alleged. The Attorney General's office disagrees with that interpretation of this law. Okay. Um, Is there anything we can do to make that? I, I can remember having a similar discussion on gun shops. So mm -hmm. uh, we're dealing with what may someday be a constitutional right in this state, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure that even though we protect the right, I don't know that we want to say you can just plop it anywhere without adequate septic provisions or water or water tests. Or Certainly. So things. let me clear up a few um, points about what this law doesn't do. Uh, it uh, does not change the ability of the state to regulate medical professions, particularly through content neutral regulations that say, no, you have to check your water, you have to have uh, medical licenses for anyone practicing medicine, you need to follow basic health and safety regulations. It does not change criminal law. Um, so the example was brought up of um, the doctor in Pennsylvania who was uh, killed a few of his patients. Uh, that is still against the law, uh, even if you pass this law. Um, it does not change tort law, including medical malpractice, so a patient would still have a right to sue a doctor who was practicing outside their license. Um, it does not change, uh, again, our licensing requirements. We can still require that abortion um, providers be licensed under the regulations of uh, this state. Um, it doesn't change federal law, so the uh, so-called partial birth abortion ban obviously is still in effect. Um, and uh, again, it doesn't, if issues arise with licensing or um, anything like that and this body wants to take action to pass future laws, it doesn't prevent uh, you from doing that either. Does that clear up mm -hmm. the question? So, so the, other, the other comment that was made earlier mm -hmm. uh, was that um, schools would be able to promote abortion but not uh, right to life issues, there would be a barrier to free speech with it, should this go forward with the public entities included. What the law does is prevent schools from restricting access to abortion. Um, so a school can't expel a student for getting an abortion. A school can't prevent a school nurse from uh, talking, counseling a student about abortion if that's within their uh, practice. Um, but it does not restrict um, the school or the school nurse's ability to also talk to the uh, student about other options. Including right to life options. Including, including right to abortion, life. Or, or I'm sorry, including adoption or uh, okay. carrying the pregnancy oh, okay. to term. All right. Yes. Um, thank you for those questions. Um, so 
So one other important thing to note about the difference between uh, the statute and um, Prop 5 is that, uh, well, the statute recognizes uh, fundamental rights, um, including the right to choose or refuse contraception or sterilization, and uh, the fundamental right to choose um, whether to carry your pregnancy to term, to give birth, or to have an abortion. Um, it does not specify the standard of scrutiny, whereas Prop 5 says um, that these rights will be subject to strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is the highest level of scrutiny that courts ever give government action. This says it's a fundamental right. Fundamental rights may get strict scrutiny or they may get a lesser standard of scrutiny. Um, so this is actually one way in which the bill is um, slightly less specific than Prop 5. Um, and uh, it's just important to note that um, you know, it doesn't spell this out, uh, but it can only be the same or less restrictive than uh, what Prop 5 does. So it doesn't, there's no way to make it more uh, restrictive. Um, it is also uh, the Attorney General's position that this law is not ambiguous. Uh, it seems very clear about what it does. Um, but if a court were to have questions about whether or not this law was intended to change the current practice in Vermont, um, the court could uh, and would look um, first at uh, section one of the bill, uh, which is the legislative intent. Legislative intent spells out that uh, Vermont currently does not restrict the right to abortion. The General Assembly intends this act to safeguard the existing rights to access reproductive health services in Vermont. Um, and uh, you know, if there was am any ambiguity in the law, uh, I believe that section would um, clarify for the court uh, that it is not intended to change the current practice. Um, and if the court wasn't satisfied with that, which it should be, it could look back at all of the testimony that you're taking now um, and the testimony that will happen um, on the, in the floor debate and um, discern your intent from that. So could we say the current practice in Vermont, mm -hmm. we've heard there's medical ethics, there's one federal law, mm -hmm. but that the current practice is not to allow late term Abortions just for no reason. Abortion later, mm. yeah, abortion later in pregnancy, whatever the new term is. My understanding is that the current practice is to um, not legislatively restrict abortion access in Vermont. Uh, and that's what this bill is intended to do. That um, That is a decision that Vermont has left up to a doctor and a patient. Right, but the, the counter has been that the medical code of ethics prevents just the abortion of a viable fetus without the mother's health and welfare being extended. You know, the, the, the testimony was something about lying through the teeth and there's thousands of late-term abortions for no reason other than mm -hmm. I just decided I don't want to go through with it. Um, I think that's what's causing some of the angst in the public is I think most people or many people understand health, welfare of either the child or the mother, mm -hmm. but the thought of I just don't feel like it, if you happen to think that women act like that, um, is causing some angst. And we've been told, no, you can't do that because doctors would lose their license if they did it. But that's that's the tension I'm I'm feeling. Is it? Yeah, okay. So I hope I can answer your question. I can speak to the state of the law in Vermont. I am less Maybe familiar with the state of medical practice, practice and I would defer to the uh, medical society on that. Um, 
the law in Vermont currently says un unrestricted access. Uh, we do regulate medical professions, of course. We do regulate clinics, just like every clinic. Um, but this legislature has never restricted. Um, Have we ever said unrestricted access, or we just? This legislature hasn't, hasn't weighed in Everything one way or another. Is, yeah, so it's a blind slate. Correct. This law is intended to codify that. The blank slate. Essentially, yes. Okay. I'm trying to envision codifying a blank slate. But... Okay. Let me ask this question. It looks like this, if, H57. If, if the blank slate were in place, what would be different from what we currently have? So, including Roe v. Wade. Right. So, um, in the near term, this will not change anything. Uh, it will um, prevent future governments from taking action uh, to discriminate against um, those who seek abortions or get abortions and those who provide abortions. Unless and until this body decides otherwise. But the Roe v. Wade talked about, and Prop 5 talks about a compelling state interest, and mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade talks about if they said third trimester or late term, whatever the term is. Well, mm -hmm. okay. when, when you yeah. asked to have, will we be very clarified too as well? Okay. okay, yeah. But there is some recognition that the state might have an interest once mm -hmm. you have a viable child in protecting that life and, you know, along with the life of the mother and. Mm -hmm. Things get more complicated at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're, if what we're trying to do is reproduce Roe v. Wade, which mm -hmm. is the governing mm -hmm. decision right now. Yeah. I, I think just the public feedback I'm getting, and I'm getting it from pro-choice liberal women, mm -hmm. um, that that's the concern, that this is more why, that Roe v. Wade puts some potential for state action, and I think Prop 5 did. It's a high scrutiny, mm -hmm. but it's there, and this bill does not reflect that. I think I understand the concern. So um, Roe versus Wade was the initial decision that set out that uh, women have a fundamental right uh, to access abortion. That is what this bill says. There is a fundamental right. Roe versus Wade then went ahead and said, uh, because there's a fundamental right, um, we're going to uh, sort of lay out a framework um, for analyzing laws that uh, restrict access to abortion. And it said, in the first trimester, no law can restrict access to abortion. In the second trimester, there's a different, um, the governmental interest at stake is a little bit different. Um, and in the third trimester, the governmental interest is uh, even stronger. Um, <coughs> it said the states may. The states may, okay, but do not have to. Yes, important distinction. Um, but all of that was under the rubric of a fundamental right. The court, you know, the, the major takeaway from right. that decision was this is a fundamental right, um, but that doesn't mean that the state can never take action to affect it, right? So the state can still pass laws that affect the health and safety um, of the procedure, for instance. Um, so The way that the US Supreme Court has analyzed this particular fundamental right has shifted a little bit over time. They've gotten, they've already sort of cut back on the protections of Roe versus Wade. They've never said it's not a fundamental right, but they've shifted away from that trimester framework and they've adopted this undue burden standard of Casey, uh, Planned Parenthood versus um, Casey Family Services, or 
Planned Parenthood versus Casey was decided in 1992, I want to say. Um, and uh, so now they say, OK, it's a fundamental right, but the state can restrict it as long as it doesn't place an undue burden on um, the access to abortion. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. And it did not, it did away with the trimester framework. Okay. So that's an instance where the court said, uh, even though it's a fundamental right, we're going to allow some more government interference here. Um, in other contexts, courts have found fundamental rights but have allowed even greater uh, governmental interference. So for example, in Loving versus Virginia and Obergefell versus Hodges, the state said marriage is a fundamental right, right? Loving versus Virginia was the anti-miscegenation case um, where they said you can't restrict interracial marriage. Um, so marriage, as we know now, is a fundamental right. But states re still restrict it all the time on the basis of age, incest, uh, number. You can only have one marriage. Um, and you still have to get a license to be married, right? Um, so in other words, uh, courts have found that you know, in certain cases, even when there is a fundamental right, governments can still restrict it. Now, strict scrutiny is uh, the absolute highest. <laughs> no, this is from the governor. This is can't be. Am I going to go to a bill signing? No. So where were we? Can so back up a little bit. So certainly. Um, so fundamental rights are not inviolable, right? We know that the government can take action to regulate um, fundamental rights in various ways, uh, depending on the right and the circumstances. Um, strict scrutiny, which is in uh, Proposition 5, is the absolute highest bar that the government would have to pass to um, restrict a fundamental right. It is, it is the highest bar. Um, this bill doesn't have strict scrutiny in it, so it could be less than strict scrutiny, but you can't get more than strict scrutiny. OK. okay? Does that help? Mm -hmm. OK. Anything else? Any other questions? No. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> Are you, uh, we we want to get all of your testimony. OK. It's, it's helpful to understand the the legal issues around this, because that's, that's where it derives from, really. Right, legal issues is what I do. Um, let me just see what I've already covered and what I haven't. You know, I actually think I've covered uh, most of my major points. So are there any other questions I can help you with? Uh, my question is, when can we get your testimony? I knew that was coming. <laughs> I did when, know that it, was coming. It really will be very important for us to understand um, the issues that you've covered. And mm -hmm. you've heard the questions. I think they're very fundamental and important questions, too all the members of the committee, so um, having, Absolutely. having your testimony is important. Yes. So, um, I so, will be happy and to. So I do have one last question, I think, but the, there's a concern, I think, that is prevalent in, in the Senate, in the House, and out in the real world. Mm -hmm. Not that this isn't the real world. We're elected by the real world to be here as real people. But um, I, take, I, say, I say that very seriously because I think sometimes people look at us and say that all we are is just legislators, but we represent a body of people who have put us here to make some really difficult decisions. So, but uh, the, the question I, that I have is that will, as some people propose, will age 57 be, um, cause harm? No. 
that, that's an important question to ask and to answer. Um, I mean, we asked that question with Prop 5, but the Prop 5 goes out to the voters. It's not our decision. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier for us to support something that goes out to the voters. But in this case, it's something that is our decision, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we want to assure ourselves that there are no unintended consequences mm -hmm. and that it won't cause harm uh, when and if it passes. To the extent that you are satisfied with the current state of practice in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, this will not change that. Um, so if you think that the current state of practice is not causing harm, H57 will not cause harm. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. All right. Our pledge council has left us. Um, I was going to ask her to come back up. I think she might be back in just a minute. We're going to take a break, and then uh, about a two-minute break, and then when uh, Bryn Hare gets back, we'll, we'll put her in the seat and ask her a couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll go back to our committee room for our next um, issue after some short break. Okay. Persevering. It's been a long year. <laughs> so, um, you heard the conversation at the end, and I, so it's not that I, I'm, I'm not asking for clarification right now, mm -hmm. but I think you've heard the questions, especially those from Senator Cummings, regarding uh, the difference between H57 and Prop 5 that, um, that the Solicitor General has brought to us, uh, the answers. And so we'll be looking for similar clarification in our committee from your perspective mm -hmm. as our Ledge Council. And, and then understanding what, if any, effect the Roe v. Wade, no Roe v. Wade, how it falls to the state, what that means. Um, because we will be taking more testimony on Friday. And the more testimony we take, the more confused we get about what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So it will be extremely helpful for you. Um, we'll, we'll schedule some time uh, for us to have a discussion. Sure. So that, that's all I was going to say okay. at this point, unless you have questions. All right. Okay. And so, and then the, the, the court cases that have existed, I know the Casey court case in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. was it um, uh, reduces the um, strict scrutiny standard to another standard and what that means as time goes on. Um, so something of that. Sure, I'd be glad to put together some summaries of the of the relevant case law for you. Okay, and then and then the, the, the more critical question I think is we've heard a lot of information today about what effect the bill might have in decision making by public entities mm -hmm. in this state. So some response to that. Yeah, what is a public entity? Yes, mm -hmm. and so we'll, we'll I know we're going to have additional testimony on Friday that will bring further questions, so we'll um, look for your skills, sure. information, sure. professionalism. Okay. I will be there. Okay. <coughs> so Anything else? I would Senator. just say to you, it would be helpful for me, and we've had some people in, in practice, what is um, not the legal side, because, the, mm -hmm. because basically the law is silent mm -hmm. on this. There is no law. There is no law. So there is no law. So when we talk about current practice in the law, um, and this will continue um, the, from the legal side, won't change anything. Mm -hmm. That very much I accept is, is probably true. Um, what I don't get is the practice on the ground Okay. And why, what in law we said versus the practice of what is happening, medical practice. the medical practice sure. around that. So that was one of the people who we were supposed to have at least one, probably a couple more, have testimony from. So I would, yeah, they were going to be here today. So we'll get them in and I'll schedule some time so that we can talk about that. And I know that there are ethical guidelines that are, are uh, inform uh, medical practice, so we'll try and get some of that information. That 
because it's that medical practice side yeah, I that agree I um, would, I'm most interested in supporting, mm -hmm. um, not changing, and, um, you know, and, and forwarding that. Okay, we'll do that. Bryn will bring it to us. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, Bryn is on the legal side. But oh, how okay. you interpret you. legally what is the, the, the practical practice of what people are doing Good. is what I'm most interested well, in. Well, and that was one of the reasons why Garen Marshall was here, because of his own personal experience, mm -hmm. the patient experience that we don't hear about. And as he said, that um, people are very hesitant to speak up about this. It's hard to find people who are willing to do that. And he's circling around trying to identify people willing to help inform people like us. So we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll see what we can get and we'll do that. Anything else that you would like, Senator? Yeah. Okay. Bryn, thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a break.